You're listening to the Stoic Philosophy Podcast, practical wisdom for everyday life. I'm Justin Vakula, and this is episode 48, Sustainability with Kai Whiting. Visit my website at justinvacula.com, where you can connect with me on social media and see past content on SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and other platforms. Support my work by becoming a donor through Patreon or PayPal. Share my content, subscribe, and leave feedback to help support my efforts and keep this project going. I'd like to hear from you. Email me, justinvacula at gmail.com. Today's special guest, Kai Whiting, is a university lecturer and researcher based at the University of Libsyn in Portugal. His specialist subjects are modern stoic challenges, sustainable energy, and materials. He tweets at Kai Whiting. Find more information about him, including means of contact, in his recent paper discussed in this episode in the show notes. Let's get on to our conversation. All right. Thank you for joining me for a conversation today. Ah, You're most welcome. Absolutely most welcome. It's brilliant to be here. Thank you. So to start, what sparked your interest in Stoicism? I guess it's always like one person has to have a tragic story. So I could have had a tragic story, but didn't (laughs) because of Stoicism. So I happen to be reading Obstacle is the Way, it was recommended to me. And so I'm reading this and then I find out that my grandma is dying. So I'm going to the hospital with like Obstacle of the Way is in my hand, not knowing that at this point that she's going to die. And I see like chaos occurring around me as my family is coming to like the conclusion that the most important member in the entire unit is going to die. And I'm reading, I'm at the point where it's like, you cannot control death. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I have a choice. I literally sat at a crossroads, it felt like. I can go into meltdown, which I unfortunately saw a lot of members do, my family, or I can choose not to because perception and observation are not the same thing. So when I compare what I would have done had I not been reading that book at the time, I would have you know, been very, very sad and I would have took a lot longer to get over it. I got, I, you never get over death exactly, but people said to me in the family, but you don't seem very affected. It wasn't that I wasn't affected. It was like, there's nothing else I can do. Right. And two years later, I was happening to read, and it's no joke, I was having to read How to Be a Stoic, and then I get news that my granddad's dying. So oh, I was wow. like, I got, I, literally, I, it's not, I didn't buy the books because people were dying. I just happened to be reading those books when they were. And it was like over very small periods. It wasn't months. It was like, we, we, it was a week. So I buy the book, and then like, my grandma dies like within a week. I buy the book, and my granddad dies two years later within a week. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to take that as a as a sign from the universe that maybe stoicism would be really helpful in my life. So that was like my stoic transformation story, I guess. Yeah. It, I didn't have a crisis, but I should have done. <laughs> so that's that's how it came about. And then I started to ask myself, how can I contribute? Because I'm an academic and I didn't want to just say, oh, stoicism did this for me. It was like, what can I do for stoicism? How can we also progress collectively? What is my role in that? Because I didn't have like a backstory of like I read an ancient Stoic, I didn't. So I was like, oh, I can be a modern Stoic and I can contribute. It was only later that I found out that there's like, oh, the ancient notes from Epictetus are better. And it was something like, oh, really? Because I'm not a philosopher. So it was kind of <laughs> came about like, a surprising kind of bit backwards. Yeah, surprising way. Yeah. That's my, yeah, that's my transformation story. Yeah, so some wisdom from Ryan Holiday and Massimo Piliucci, as you mentioned, authors of those books, that was helpful for you in a time of grief and a time of loss, and you were able to rebuild from some of those experiences and cope pretty well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't even say we build. I was just, it was because it would just literally be able to build. I was, I am sad. There's not a day that I don't think of, you know, my grandparents occasionally, but I don't feel sad about their passing. I just feel that that had to happen, and it happened. Uh, and so it, it wasn't on my exactly the acceptance of of just realizing there's nothing I can do. I can get sad about it, like really traumatically sad, not to the point that I cannot function the way that I want to, or I can just take their memory and say, "What can I do to make the world a better place? How would they like me to live my life?" So that's why I took from from modern Stoics. All right. So that's a way of, of giving back and building, as you say, maybe encouraging other people, processing grief or loss in a way of being productive and sharing wisdom with others, helping others and yourself along that journey. 
That's correct. Exactly. Exactly. I could. I wish I could say I read Seneca on grief, but I didn't. So <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't do that. I uh, should do that. I find like I don't know. As I said, I'm not a philosopher, so I found I find reading the the, the ancient texts are really difficult. Oh. I don't find them readily accessible unless I know exactly why I want to use them. I guess it like, comes from I'm a back, my background is like engineering. So in engineering, you come with a different approach. Like I have to, I want X, how do I get there? In philosophy, I don't know where I'm going. Like I, I have a starting point and I don't know where I'm ending. It's not like I need to solve <laughs> a problem that I have clearly in my mind. So now that I am doing sort of philosophy training or I'm writing um, papers in philosophical journals, I'm finding that the, the whole thinking process is backward, right? I don't know what the solution <laughs> is. I don't know what I'm trying to achieve. With an engineer, it's like, I want a bridge. Okay, how do we best build that bridge? Right. What do you want the bridge to look like? And then I go backwards. Philosophy, I go forwards. Yeah. So it's a completely different game. Yeah, some of the letters from Seneca will focus on certain topics, but yet you'll read this and say, oh, wow, this can apply to this life situation, that life situation. That's an interesting insight. But you're not, yeah, you're not necessarily going in with a specific goal. You'll just happen to find things along the way and maybe do with it what you will. Exactly. So I don't think I have the right training. It's going to take me a few more years, decades to sort of to undo my <laughs> academic training to to always be like, I have X. How do I get to X? So that's something that I'm, fi- I'm struggling with, to be honest. I'm struggling with, with as an academic. It's really interesting. But that's probably why I'm finding that the, the ancient texts are not as accessible. Because I always think that I should be trying to solve something where people say, no, you just read it and it, the solution comes to you. And I don't, it's something I don't understand. A different like, approach. It's but, a different approach, exactly. Yeah, what you did do, though, is you focused on one topic yourself, stoicism and sustainability. So what led you to that? So I work in the mechanical engineering department, and I'm supposed to be working on environmental issues, which I do. So I do have my aside. So the bit that we talked about materials is something that I actually work out uh, on a day-to-day basis and get quote-unquote uh, paid for. So I thought, like, what does stoicism say about sustainability? So I started to look... There was one chapter in how to be a stoic and then there was sustainability in terms of being sustainable person like to be able to sustain yourself Mm -hmm. but there was nothing on the collective which is very strange because in the environmental discipline you don't ever think about the individual you always think about where is the world going are we going like to hell in a a hand car Mm -hmm. are we um surpassing planetary boundaries it's always talking about we how we use resources so the i like how I do something has never ever occurred to me. So I started to look and found out there wasn't very much, if nothing at all. So I said, well, if I want stoicism to say something about sustainability, then I need to be the one who goes and, you know, digs around the foundation. So I got a team together who could help me work things through. And I started to ask, like, what can stoicism do for the planet? Mm -hmm. Like, it sounds like a really, it's a very, very big question. Yes. And what kind of language do you have to use? So like, I got, oh, quote unquote again, told off yesterday for saying like collective eudaimonia. It's like <laughs> the Greeks would not say collective eudaimonia. There is no collective eudaimonia. You have to be a eudaimon. That's a person. I'm like, well, what would you call it? Like, what do you do if you want to collectively achieve something? So there was like autological challenges that I had to still having to overcome but i think that the conversation is necessary i i don't think it's a good idea to only look inwards yes you have to get your stuff together and you have to know what you're about to contribute to the world Mm -hmm. but if you just see yourself as an individual it's completely against the circles of concern right Mm -hmm. and eudaimonia that's the good spirit the good demon the human flourishing right Exactly. So it's for me, it is very difficult to flourish as an ind- individual. That doesn't mean like the sage in theory, they can. But if you're not a sage and in stories you're either a sage or you're not, you would really struggle to flourish without other people's input. And you would certainly, as a sage even, struggle to flourish if you can't breathe good air. Like if you cannot breathe, you cease to be a sage pretty quickly <laughs> in, the physical, in the physical sense. Right. So Stoicism, I felt that Stoicism had the answer to this because of its circles of concern, because, of its, because it says it's not about you. It's about being rational, right? It's about being a rational, moral being. It's not about saving your physical self. So that's why suicide is permitted, right? And in certain cases, it's, it's, a, it's a rational outcome of a consequence. Right. And you say, okay, so is it rational to consume stuff? How rational is it 
to deplete our oceans? How rational is it to want more and more and more? Like, at which point does this cease to be rational in any way, shape, or form? So then I started to look at that and Epictetus says, well, you know, things are just things and therefore they're indifferent. And you go, yes, okay, they're indifferent, but how indifferent should I be to indifferences? <laughs> and so I started <laughs> to yeah. ask those kind of questions. And I started to ask, and I'll ask you this one, like, do you, when you buy a can of tuna, if you buy a tuna, do you think about, like, the impact on dolphins? Do you do that? Or you just think about your Thursday night dinner? That's a personal question, I guess. You might not eat tuna, but what do you, what do you think about when you go and buy a product from a supermarket generally? Yeah, and are people even thinking about that? It's often out of sight, out of mind, or, oh, this is the way things have always been, or they don't realize the consequences of their action. Oh, what makes me feel good? What other people say is good, but are they really deeply thinking into it? Absolutely. But as a Stoic, we have an obligation, and the word is obligation, to not look at if we have rights, because we don't, but to say, what is my obligation towards the wider world? So the person, you know, the tuna one is maybe like you say, well, do I have an obligation to, to animals? If you buy certain clothes, for example, Zara was involved in slavery, slave practice in 2017 in Brazil. So if I buy Zara, I'm buying into slave labor. Do I not have an obligation towards my fellow human beings who are being subjected to this treatment? When I buy a, a VW, a Volkswagen, do I not have some kind of virtual, a question of whether this is virtuous, considering that one, NOx are very dangerous to children's health. A lot of children die under the age of five because of asthma. We know that city, urban city environments are not very helpful in terms of like being able to have a helpful, happy life, being able to go running outside. Children cannot play outside because of NOx. We know that Volkswagen lied <laughs> and put cheat devices in vehicles, both in the UK, uh, well, UK, Europe, widespread, US. They tried to cover up the cheat device. When they uh, were caught, they then said, okay, uh, we're going to find another way of cheating and got caught again recently. So as, as a stoic or as a, as a progressor, what is my moral obligation when I buy a car? Right. Do I have one? My answer would be, yeah, I have one. Because if I'm giving my money to a company that I know lies, categorically lies and cheats the system, then really what I'm saying is it's okay to do that. Because they only care, in their case, they only care about the bottom line. Perhaps a boycott would be a reasonable response and say, we as a strict community do not appreciate lying. That is not a value that we hold. That takes courage, right? It takes courage to tell Volkswagen no. Mm -hmm. But surely we are called to be courageous in that. Once you have the scientific understanding that Knox is bad and you have the ultra, you know, the business understanding that what they did was maximize shareholder value and not consider society at large, we might not say stakeholder because we don't see ourselves as stoics as necessarily stakeholders, but from integrating within the community, were they acting in our best interest? Were they acting virtuously? Were they acting in self-control? Was there any justice here? Did any of those children who died get any kind of money? You know, did the family get money to help with the grieving process and bury their kids? If the answer is no, then I have to question, you know, is this a product that I can support? As a stoic, I'm called to positively lobby because lobby has been taken out, you know, as a negative word. But I am called to positively lobby government, regardless of that government is like the UK or the US because we're world citizens and say that this is not OK. So, for example, in Stuttgart this month, they've now said, you, you know, you cannot have your Volkswagen in the city. Oh, wow. Like they will they will phase them out in Stuttgart. So now people are worried about the sell on. They're like, oh, now I've got a Volkswagen. I can't sell it on. Well, and that needs the Volkswagen need to pay you for that, right? They should take it off you. So they're trying to sort that out. But people don't want to buy a Volkswagen in Germany in those areas because they know that its value, sell on value, is limited. So that starts to hurt Volkswagen. That starts to say cheating, cheat devices, manipulation of data, threatening universities who show that what you're doing is wrong, that is not okay. Right. So that was the kind of things I was asking like stoics in that paper, like what is our response to that? 
Mm -hmm. So we're to be responsible consumers, citizens of the world, and really think about the impact of our actions here, the decisions we make. And it's not just a minor thing. There can be some grave consequences where to examine that. You're in a globalized world. Your dollar, your pound, your euro, your peso really matters. Because when they have lobbies that are so powerful that laws do no, no longer matter, only power that you have is to say, I refuse to spend my dollar my power, my euro, my peso, there. So as a stoic, the counter side is you're called to, you know, read science, you know, to be literate. I don't mean read academic papers, but certainly be literate in, say, the climate change debate. It is not okay to say that, okay, well, certain Republicans tell me that climate change is not an issue and the world is hotter than, you know, it's, it's not true that the world is hotter than it's ever been. No environmentalist claims that the world is hotter than it's ever been. That's a, that's a fallacy, a straw man fallacy. What we claim is that the acceleration of temperature change is as fast as we've ever measured, which is a vastly different argument to the one that I've heard recently. Oh, well, we had hotter climates, you know, 100,000, 200,000 years ago. You know, well, not 100,000 because it was in the Antarctic, the colder climate, but we certainly had hotter climates earlier in the Earth's history. I'm like, yeah, but we didn't support 7 billion people. We did not have like 80% of our people on coastlines within one meter of the sea. Mm -hmm. So it's also to understand the context and say, okay, and what happens if climate change isn't real? You know, maybe it's, you know, it's all fought, fake. What happens if I still take good decisions and I'm more considerate about how I use resources? Well, that would be a better planet, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you could, even if I could show you that climate change was not a problem, which I actually, I actually cannot because there's like hundreds and thousands of scientists who have a consensus. And to understand how science consensus work, which uh, Massimo has actually recently released a book on that and talks a lot about scientific literacy, mm. then we have an obligation of Stoics to, to be literate. If you don't like science, then you have an obligation to find somebody who does like science and ask them, like, okay, is climate change a problem? Or, you know, is what my politician who has no idea, never studied, never read anything, is like on this particular subject, is his opinion valid? People say in the sort of like modern world that every opinion is just an opinion. Well, well, I can have an informed opinion or I can just have an opinion. And I think that an informed opinion is much more reasonable right. than an uninformed one. And say, for example, fake news is to question, is it fake news uh, or is are other countries also reporting this news? So, for example, I encourage people to go on YouTube and uh, watch Euro News because it gives a very balanced perspective on the on the world because it doesn't represent say uk interests with the bbc or certain right-wing us interests with the fox news so i'm like find a neutral television station if you want to watch the news and and ask yourself what are they presenting right so we're really to have a skeptical attitude about what we're consuming about what we're doing this is yes applying to the world consideration of future generations as well not just the here and now and just going 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 consuming consuming without thought of what those outcomes might be, especially if they're going to be negative. I like the way you say it, actually, because it is in terms of consumption, it's not just in terms of physical units, but yes, what you consume emotionally or like intellectually will drive your behavior. So if you believe that climate change is a problem, right, the things you buy or do not buy will change, right? You can tell me they're all indifference, right? And that's good because you should buy less, right? But what of the less should you buy. So you have to buy something, right? Mm. Eventually you're gonna need a t-shirt. I mean, not many people are gonna walk around half naked. So to say, yeah, it's it is an indifferent and it doesn't affect my virtue, but it does affect my day-to-day -day life, right? It does make being virtuous easier when I'm not worried about being shot out or I'm not worried about my health or I'm not worried about my neighbor's well-being. Like if I'm in a safe environment, then I can really progress towards virtue in, in a much more effective way of right. course the sage is different the sage can do it regardless of their condition but the sage isn't that common right so yeah it's so an, then it's an it's ideal also, right but if we exactly. have an environment in which we could better flourish it's going to be yes easier to live a, a good fulfilled life exactly because if you're worried about your health mental health or physical health how much thought do you give to other non-health concerns? It actually, what people say is that it consumes you. It consumes your thought process. Mm -hmm. So 
I, I think that yes, we should consume less as Stoics because we realize that things are only things and there are more important non-physical materials. But also we must be aware that there are things that we, we need in our function, you know, to function in society and then really be critical or observe the reality of how t-shirts are made, how shoes are made, how the food industry works, how cattle are slaughtered, right? That would be really helpful to use it as a stoic, to be grounded. We're always called to be grounded in our philosophy. You can only be grounded if you know some facts, right? Now, those facts change, like, in terms of the, I'm not saying they might, you know, facts are built on knowledge, but you have an obligation to read or listen to current knowledge or have conversations, to use a Socrates approach, to have conversations with people, to ascertain how you could best optimize your behavior to demonstrate virtue. Because I would find it really difficult if I, you know, met a Stoic and he had his, like, uh, I don't know, four by four, and he had re his music really, really loud, and like he was insulting people down the street and telling them not to feel insulted, you know, and saying, well, you shouldn't feel insulted, you know, you, sh you should just deal with it, be stoic, like, don't be emotional. <laughs> I'd be like, did you, did you understand anything about like circles of concern? Did you think about your community? Did you think about the person who has to hear your music? Did you think about the environment? Did you think about the oil spills? You know, the Exxon Valdez, you know, deep, was it? Deepwater uh, Horizon, yeah. Exactly. Did you think about that? Did you need to drive your car, like, to go and pick up, like, one thing? Could you not have gone, like, and collected a few more things? So it's just a bit, that's self-control, right? It's called, like, planning, but it's also self-control and looking at your own behavior and, and, and self-correcting and being just, not just just in your, your direct relationships with people so treating people that you directly meet but also thinking about those people who are also a part of your society and your community and how they might feel you know on the factory lines in china when they throw themselves off after you know making your favorite iphone should you not have a response to that right and there are going to be other benefits like you said okay well you're pursuing virtue you're making more responsible decisions but you're also probably saving money right if you're planning ahead and you're realizing that oh well these all these things i have all these desires i have well maybe they don't really have much worth associated with them is there really that much value and oh well i can buy this expensive new hummer and i can go to these fancy uh, fine dining establishments and spend all this money is that really worth it is it going to make me happy in the long run or is it only going to be a temporary thing and then i'm just out of money and worried about that right Financial absolutely is a big thing and it would go against rufus like to eat what is simple <laughs> so right. I, there's nothing against and like i want to say there's nothing against having a car there's nothing because if, for example if you're a father or a mother and you've got to pick up your kids then you have to have a car if you live in jacksonville you need a car right as you just can't get there so you have an obligation to your daughter to take her to school and back, right? If you don't do that, then no one else is going to do that. So I'm not promoting here that you don't have a car. What I'm saying is that when you make a choice to buy a car, that you think clearly about the kind of message you want to send when you're driving it, right? Because people are going to see your car, you're advertising that company. So personally, if I have a choice, I don't actually drive, but I made a choice not to drive because I didn't want to be a hypocrite in my sustainability classes telling people like, yeah, you shouldn't drive. But that's my calling, right? That's my, that is my uh, station, to use a stoic term, right? Stoics are very like, in your station, what are you called to know? But if you buy a car, if you buy a car, you are called to know something about it. How is it made? How is the attitude of the board? How do they treat the wild environment? And you might say that they're all bad. Okay, then you, then, then, then there's no choice then. So it's easy. Then choose anyone. But, Right. Did you really do the research to be able to tell me they're all bad? We can escape all harm, right? But we can work to be minimally engaged in that. Well, okay, we're not going to go live out in the forest and just wear a toga or, <laughs> you know, just uh, have a campfire and make all of our food that way. We're, we're going to have some sort of environmental or societal impact. But exactly. how, how can we live maybe this in-between approach of maybe Absolutely. a simple lifestyle and not the extravagant lifestyle of mass consumption.
Absolutely. I mean, we're not called to be cynics, right? We're not called to like just throw, you know, I don't care. It's not, there's nothing that's so valued. No. And sometimes you might have to be a bit more extravagant because you, you've decided that you're going to be a politician, right? You've decided that you're locally going to represent your pe- the people around you. So you might, you know, you can't have a terrible looking car because you're just not going to be appreciated by that circle. But you can, in your position then, you would focus on legislation, right? You'd say, well, we have to legislate against cars being built with cheat devices and once it is legislated which it is in the u.s and it's not in the eu actually so it is legislated in the u.s then i must make sure that if they are caught they do pay more than just the fine right so yeah that person has a different obligation but they still have to tackle the same problem they still have to progress virtue you know virtue wherever their station is in my case i teach so i have to teach university students values right and when they see my colleagues with their four by four telling people, and this has happened more than once, oh, but the teacher says that, you know, we should be sustainable and environmental, but he has a four by four. I'm like, yeah. And that would make him a hypocrite, wouldn't it? <laughs> like, and they say, what about you? I said, I have a bicycle. <laughs> I'm a vegetarian because I cannot tell you that meat consumption, the way that we, we produce meat on the mass market is the number one contributor to climate change is not cars. And then tell you that and then you catch me eating a you know steak. Mm. That's incoherent. And I'd rather you look at me and say, actually, that man made that sacrifice. I don't see it as a sacrifice, but that's how they see it. I can as well. So as a teacher, I'm called to a different role. Right. But even if, even if let's say you say, well, I'm not a politician, I'm not a teacher, no one listens to my opinion, whatever car you drive, whatever brand of clothes you wear, you are advertising value, right? I have a financial value, like if you're wearing Armani, then you're saying something about your, your social and economic status, but you're also saying that what you value, right? It's not a virtue because virtues and values are different, but you are stating that. If you're only a house husband, you still... By virtue of, by use the term virtue, but by walking out, you are stating something. As a stoic, we, I think that we are called to be very careful about what values we demonstrate. And that's the beauty of stoicism. That's why I love being a stoic, because I'm called on a regular basis to journal and reconsider what I'm stating, either directly speaking it or, you know, walking around with my, you know, a bag on or a t shirt on or, a certain behavior because it's behavior you have to point to you don't want if the, you know well Aristotle said that you'd have to be dead first but <laughs> you have to point to that you have to point to the Udemon in the graveyard and say oh so when I went to his house he had all this money he had a great you know he had three pianos he had two Ferraris and he spent his life telling us that he was like frugal he was only frugal when it came to the, he was only frugal when it came to the bill he never shared right he always said no I I, I only had free beers so I'm only going to buy pay for free beers I'm not going to pay for three and a half so he pretended to be frugal but his reality was different and then stoicism that's not you know you've misunderstood and misrepresented stoicism right and so we're we're called to practice what we preach and to be a good absolutely. role model in a way right people are going to see what we're doing with our lives uh, look at our behaviors think about what we said and we want to yes make those good impressions if we want to see this behavior from others well surely we have to show to others what we would like them to look like absolutely and i think stoicism is one the um, it didn't it didn't it's in the balance now that it's uh, quite a, still some quite a small group but more and more people are finding stoicism interesting. So you, you will find in sports groups, in entrepreneurial groups, they are really wanting to get into stoicism. And that's partly to do with obstacles away. That's partly to do with just the fascination around stoicism. People like Massimo have written like how to be a stoic, or even they come across it from CBT. So we have this really beautiful, I think it's a beautiful moment of like, we're starting to grow and be recognized as a community. And I don't mean academic community, I mean as a collective stoa. And so how do we contribute to that stoa? When people see stoicism, what do they think it is? Right, we're responsible for that. So now when I hear generally left-wing, left-wing leaning people say, well, what does stoicism say about sustainability? I can give them an answer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's my contribution. And your contribution is to make people that I cannot reach aware of stoicism because that's the beauty of having a podcast if we don't look beyond the individual level which is where we are still focusing a lot of our efforts in both the academic and the non-academic um section of the community then we can't explore those ideas we're still saying well i shouldn't be angry and i and i shouldn't you know be in, feel insulted yeah correct and how are you going to get that across to the rest of the world how are they going to know that that is what stoicism stands for at the moment 
So I think it will change. You know, should, should we be vegetarian? Is that, you know, like we have, there's a group called Stoicism and Veganism. I'm like, should we be vegetarian or should we be vegan? I'm like, well, help me do research. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer. I think that we cannot justify the mass market consumption because we can't justify any mass market consumption, right? If it doesn't build virtue. I've had the question is, is it capitalism or socialism, right? I'm like, it's neither. It's which aspects of capitalism drive virtue? So, for example, if the accumulation of wealth benefits all of humankind and is and benefits animals, plants, and the rest of the environment, then capitalism isn't you know, a problem. If capitalism is twisted to represent the interests of one percent, then it becomes a problem because capitalism doesn't say that there should be no regulation. If you read Adam Smith clearly, there's an, he said regulation is important. He won't use that word, but he'll say regulation is important. So, is capitalism per se evil? No. Is Marxism a better response? In some areas, yes. Was the way that Marxism was approached in the Soviet Union, was that something that we as Stoics should applaud? Absolutely not. But we are called to ask these questions, I think, and to say, well, what should our opinion be on tax evasion, the Paradise Papers, right? Right now, we don't have a response because we're still kind of like trying to get out Aristotle's beard about what <laughs> Eudemenia thinks, you know, should be for us, like us as individuals. And I think that you've missed the point of stoicism is if you only, and the thing is not that I, anything wrong with looking at psychological aspects, but if you only look at those, then you missed a beautiful component of stoicism that has a lot to be explored. Right. And these are complex questions. There's not going to be an easy fix and looking to a system that's already in place might not be the way. Well, what are the alternatives or what can we take from certain systems, as you say, to have a, a better society, right? I think that there is a, there's a danger if one does not allow stoicism to grow in that respect, right? Religion or any or philosophy ossifies. If all you do is say, well, and I've had this, but Epictetus didn't say that, Kai. But Epictetus didn't know about carbon emissions, right? But saying that, if you go to the Greenland course, you get ice core from Greenland. We have them now in labs. We know that the Roman period is the most contaminated period in terms of lead contamination than any time before the Industrial Revolution. So they had a major contamination issue in Rome or the Roman Empire, Empire right? People were getting sick in the mercury mine. Mercury is poisonous. There was mercury mines all over the place. Armadin in Spain, I've lived there, was a majorly important mine for mercury for the Roman Empire, Emperor and Empire, right? Because the lead piping, <laughs> lead piping, the water was not, is not an issue, but the way that, that it was mined, it was. So they did have a massive contamination issue. Now the question is, had Epictetus known about the contamination issue that reached Greenland and could demonstrate clearly that there was a correlation between the way that they mined in open pit mines and the amount that they mined and the environmental impact in Greenland, then yes, I think he would have something to say about it. But he wasn't aware of that, right? So it's very dangerous to just say, well, Stoicism didn't say anything about that. Therefore, we don't have an opinion. I'm like, but it didn't say anything about it, possibly because they didn't know, didn't have the scientific knowledge, they didn't know where the brain was, for example. They didn't know about the environmental impact. And we don't know how much they knew that we lost because of the way that Roman Catholicism of the time did not protect Stoic or what they would call pagan sources. Mm -hmm. They did later on in the medieval period, yes, but they did destroy like a lot of material in the fourth century. So maybe they did have an answer about environmental issues and it was lost. Not because it was against Christianity, it just wasn't seen as important. Or perhaps they did think it was against Christianity because it was talking about nature as like a kind of God and needing to protect it. I don't know. But I, I can't say, put my hand on my heart and say, they never had an opinion on that. They may have done, we just may have lost it. It might not have been directly addressed, but we can still look to ideas like justice, like prudence, like compassion, a lot of these perspectives which come within Stoicism. Absolutely. I mean, prudence is to be careful, right? To act carefully with consideration and then weighing up a certain action based on what you know. That's sustainable development. Like if it ever was a like an ancient word for the term sustainable development, it would be that. It would be to look at 
future generations what they need to estimate because you can never know and and work with the resources that you have and to act on what you know so that in the future you you avoid catastrophe right which is what we do on a personal basis so i know that one day i'm going to die so i you know kiss my you know my partner my mother knowing and i say i'm kissing a mere mortal because i know one day that that person is going to die now, it doesn't, it's not because I feel in, completely indifferent to that person, right? It is a preferred in, indifferent in a stoic sense, but not in a non-stoic sense. But I must, as I said in the beginning, like know that one day someone's going to die and act accordingly, right? The sustainable development is the same way. We know that there are resources that in the future they're going to need, and we need to be careful about how we manage them, use them accumulate them so that our great great grandchildren do not turn around and say well they weren't very prudent that's exactly the word they're going to use so i think stoicism is that that wonderful philosophy that can say yes we do have an answer and we're working on it and it's something that we can contribute because our virtues and our values are not against environmental issues they're not against gender equality in fact uh, i would argue that stoicism was the first of the major eudaimonic traditions to really look at equality because we're all rational beings, right? Maybe as a starting point, we can see that too much desire can lead to some catastrophic consequences that we might, as you mentioned, just want more and more and more and more, keep going, keep going, never be fulfilled. Absolutely. We've, we've seen that now that once you get to about $15,000, I think, right? There is no, like on average, there is, obviously, if you're living in, say, Malibu, California, you're going to need more. But on a world average, that there is no more happiness to be gained by the additional accumulation of, of capital, right? There, there, that will not contribute to your overall happiness right. or well-being. There's some right? diminishing returns on that when you have Absolutely. basic needs, when you have basic wants met. Absolutely. And then it goes back to the justice thing. So is it reasonable as a stoic that I have so much wealth and yet other people are still living on one dollar a day? Like people, for example, they'll see people begging in, say, Africa, and they'll say they're just begging. And actually, if you just bought them a pair of flip-flops, and I'm not even kidding, if you buy a person a pair of flip-flops, they can earn one dollar a day. That is, you can guarantee that because they can walk to sell their produce. If you can buy them a bicycle, and I particularly tell people to buy a really terrible bicycle because it doesn't get stolen, for a female, she can go to school. I don't agree with, with the way people beg and you shouldn't give money, but give somebody an old bicycle. Like, you do not understand the impact. When you give them a, a motorbike, they can go on to like, I think, $25 a day. When they get a car, it goes up to like $100 a day, right? So there's like clear correlations of how much $1 means. And I, I'm not a fan of like giving your money to charity and just pretending nothing happened, right? But to go and see the reality for what it is. So if you see like a homeless guy, right? And there's enough of them in say San Francisco because of the policy of sending people where it's warmer without going into detail. But you know, you see a homeless guy, if you've got an old pair of shoes at home, like give them the shoes, <laughs> right? Because if they can walk around and their quality of life will improve, right? And that would be, you know, in terms of, you know, justice, you'd be giving your shoes and you'd be addressing a real problem without giving money because, and then you're not contributing to like landfill. So there's like really simple things that as a historic you can do by just being aware of how money to a certain extent can bring like societal well-being not necessarily virtue but certainly some aspects of well-being and then when at which point it stops now again i'm not saying like throw your wealth away i mean that's that's not what i'm saying at all particularly because in the u.s like with the health situation that you guys have like you need all your money you can have just so that if you get sick you don't you don't go bankrupt but for example realizing that maybe that system isn't the best and like the nhs is a natural health system in the uk where you are guaranteed everybody is guaranteed like healthcare and i was saying yesterday that so another stoic that in the, who's based in the us that the, even the right wing paper the daily mail gets really angry if the conservative the right wing government tries to take 1 pound away from the uh, from the national health service they see it as un-British. Hmm. The wing and the right wing have is that the NHS is holy. <laughs> like <they're, laughs> That everybody needs to feel that if they get sick, they won't die. And because the government is the biggest buyer of pharmaceuticals, there's no way to increase the prices because they just won't pay that price. 
Right, they just won't do it because they they're the biggest buyer and there's very small buyers elsewhere, but they would just lock themselves out of the market. So it's like you're like asking yourself that question. Yes, I can give a pair of shoes because that would because I've done research on like how much shoes change somebody's life. And also I can look at like the National Health Service and say, I can still live in a capitalist. I mean, the UK is quite capitalist, let's be honest. But I can have aspects of like socialism where I can guarantee that people don't get sick. But if they get sick and they can be cured, they will be cured, right? In another discussion I had recently, I said, if you were a sage, the only way you would lose your sagehood is if you had a mental illness or a concussion of some just, you know, like a CTE, for example, that would be the only way that you would lose your sagehood. So as a stoic, I feel like we have an obligation to understand the nature of the brain, to understand how to protect people's health, to be proactive and progressive in aspects that we know support virtue, right? Regardless of what political position that, you know, you have or tendency to say, well, as a stoic, I know that people need healthcare. That doesn't mean that I'm, I want to be communist, but I do want people to not fear that they will get sick because if you fear, you can't progress towards virtue, right? Because fear in itself is not a value that the Stoics would want you to have. And it's all very well of us saying, well, you shouldn't have fear. You tell that to someone dying of cancer. Like you tell them that. Well, you shouldn't be fearful that you have like brain tumor. That's a very cold way of looking at it. That's not really looking at circles of concern. That's not putting yourself in their position and saying, you are me. And I am you because of the circles of concern. I go outwards and then I look at myself and then I bring those circles back on me. Right? So there's a call, it's a calling within the stoic community to do that. And so we've kind of gone, don't be insulted. Don't be worried. Don't be fearful. It's like, well, do they have a valid reason to be fearful? Can we not address the injustice of that? If we can do that, then, then I think we can solve some of the fearful problems and then more people can to progress towards towards virtue right and even with those cases we can encourage acceptance we can encourage how to properly view situations how to cope what attitudes we can have looking to others for support trying to make the best of what happens realizing that events are outside of our control these can be some things it's not going to well wave a magic wand oh don't be afraid oh don't feel bad about this right it's not going to be that easy but if we work toward this especially in times of better health perhaps we can be more prepared for these situations I mean, absolutely, Justin. I just read an academic paper yesterday which says that we underplay the importance and influence of luck, you know, fate. Like a lot of people say, well, I deserve this because I, which is not a stoic position, but I deserve this because I work hard, right? Like the other person doesn't deserve A, B, and C because they didn't work hard enough. And actually, they could have just worked as hard as you if we can identify that sometimes it is simply because we're born into the country that we're born into, with the color skin that we have, with the education opportunities that we've been able to acquire. That it not, isn't necessarily, and it would be a very stoic position to take, say, it isn't necessarily anything to do with me at all. It may well just be to do with the universe. Right. It's so, a, lot of, a lot of chance factors, even the people that we happen to meet, all this thing of, oh, well, if you were to eliminate this one element of your life, this person you met in some evening in some restaurant, and they happen to give you a good referral to get this job or something. I mean, what absolutely these chances and all these things that added to make the current circumstance? Yeah. I mean, let's take the example that you had today. Your car broke down, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if it took 25 minutes longer, that, you know, we would not be able to necessarily have this conversation. And then the person who's listening to this doesn't say, you know what? I'm inspired to, to think about mine. I'm going to buy a car. To, you know, I'm going to go to the car place tomorrow and I'm going to buy a car. So now <laughs> I'm going to rethink, I'm going to rethink that because your car broke down. They couldn't, they didn't know about what we've been discussing and they, they bought a different car. I mean, it sounds like a, a small thing, <laughs> but we just affected the life of somebody we've never met just because we were able to have a conversation, which we would not have been able to have 15 years ago. Right. So I'm in Portugal. You're in the US, we wouldn't have been able to have that. We wouldn't be able to have a stoic community. So I think a little bit of humility goes a long way, which again right. would be a very stoic position. And, and to recognize that, yeah, we have to work hard, we have to grind, but and we have to network. But sometimes we just happen to be in the right place at the right time. I mean, your name came across because I just happened to be looking at a few things and then your name kept popping up. So I was like, Ah, Justin's a go-to guy to get the message across oh, that I want. To... <laughs> and they've... Well, it's true. And if that didn't happen, I might have seen your name and been like, that's just somebody else. But because I happened to have look, you know, the week before and your name had been popping up all over the place, then I was like, right, that's, some, that's somebody I want to identify, right? 
So even on like a, a simple example of just looking at a name and recognizing it as someone who can who contributes actively to the Stoic community or looking at the name and saying that's just another person commenting on a Facebook. So even that, and we don't take that into consideration. And then we, if we then start to get into I deserve something, then that becomes a very slippery slope turn, you know, that turns away from the community feel, the recognition of unity and the recognition that really, yes, we are called to be virtuous in every aspect that we can, but that just because we are able to be virtuous as, as a non-sage, right? So not, just because we're able to be virtuous in a position, you know, in a circumstance that somebody else isn't, we shouldn't judge. So it's like also calling like, look at the person as in terms of community, look at the person as someone that belongs to you and you belong to them, but then come back to the stoic principle of, am I being angry towards them for a particular reason? <laughs> Right. Am I feeling grief for a particular reason? So this is a great combination of stoicism, and that's something that I really want to promote. Like, go out and you know be part of the stoic, but don't necessarily feel the need to judge the stoic, but contribute to it. Like, if you find somebody doing something wrong because you've researched and because you really know that, okay, I've, for example, I've misinterpreted some stoic philosophy, correct me. Correct me with love and understanding. Sometimes you have to balance. People say they go and always treat others like you would like to be treated. And I'm like, no, platinum rule, treat others how they want to be treated. Certainly something to consider even on a day to day basis. I mean, even telling a joke to someone or smiling or just saying, hey, how are you today? That could have a big impact on people where sometimes people don't get that. And those, yeah, those little events can really help brighten someone's day and lighten the load. Well, there was one thing that was in your paper. I thought, well, we can look back to decades, centuries ago, where we have all of these basic wants for a living, like hygiene, shelter. And well, they had that in ancient Roman Greece, and they seemed pretty content. And we can have a, a sense of gratitude for that. And now we still have that and in better forms. And perhaps we can look back at previous times, realize, oh, well, if other people could be content, well, so could we. And that can call for us to live more minimally, more frugal, and to just be more content with what we have. Absolutely. I think that's an excellent, excellent summary of what we've discussed, really. I mentioned also that uh, a sense of gratitude, I think that can really help some people to really think about, well, what is going well for me? What's going well in my life? Instead of just being unhappy and thinking, oh, I need this and that possession, or look at all these things that I'm missing that other people have that I don't. Perhaps having that sense of gratitude can really help us and be more responsible consumers and consume less in general. There is there's definitely understanding in the scientific community that the greater the inequality in society, the greater the need for more stuff. So in say when I lived in Spain, when Latin Americans came, which is a very unequal uh, place, they're like nobody needs a car here. Nobody cares. No one cares about brands, right? So in Colombia, people are really pro sort of brands because, for example, McDonald's. If you're going to get McDonald's, you're wealthy, right? So McDonald's is like a status symbol. Uh, and in Europe, it's like a, just, it's a really nice place to go. Actually, it's really light, and uh, they have iPads and stuff. But because it's, everybody has, yeah, it's funny because America's not like that at all. But if you can close the inequality of opportunity, and it's not just wealth, right? Because if you can close the the inequality of material services, so everybody has access to health, everybody can afford to have lighting, everybody has a reasonable, you know, shelter. I don't mean a shanty town tin roof. Then they don't. This inequality on a societal level reduces, and then there's no need for that status level item, right? If, if you have like this desire to want more which unfortunately when I was in the US I noticed in Los Angeles, then that is direct result from the inequality on a wider scale. And I think Los Angeles was shocking to me. I was like in Hollywood way and I went to use a toilet in McDonald's and this guy, he was homeless, he said, can you help me go to the toilet? And I was like, yeah. And I couldn't imagine and I didn't understand and I had to get a bin for him and help him. And I came out like I've never had that experience. And it was a kind of desperation I'd never seen before. I'd lived in Bogota, and I'd seen like people high on glue in Costa Rica when I lived there and I lived in China and I'd been, you know, I bought cake for some really poor people and spent a lot of time with them. But I'd never seen the level of desperation in a man's eyes that I'd seen in Los Angeles. And I was on Hollywood way, like the celebration. I don't know if people know what that is. Like some of you might not be American, but there's stars like on the floor, like physical concrete uh, slabs the, the, of stars the, the celebrating. Exactly. Yeah, the Walk of Fame. Thank you. I knew that you would help me on that. <laughs> uh, with all like the names of people that we should honor, 
And yet, in that street, there is the most desperate man you've ever met. People would say he doesn't, well, that's because he made the wrong choices. He should live with his choices. And I would argue that's because he lives in a very unequal society and he has no hope. He has no way of getting access to education, no way of getting access to healthcare, no way of getting access to social housing, which is in the UK a big thing. Like if you, what you would say on the wrong end, I think is it the wrong end of the tracks or something like that, wrong side of the tracks, you would get social housing, which is good quality that you wouldn't necessarily realize that is social housing, right? So they had a policy in the 90s to say social housing must not look like social housing <laughs> because we don't want people to say, oh, these are poor people. So that really brings a cohesive factor. And then the desire to prove a point with consumption because some Consum most consumption really is about proving a point when you get to a level where you just don't need stuff anymore that disappears and who knows what their story might be i mean for all we know it could have been an extremely hard-working man who had a family but then for whatever reason he ended up in a divorce in a messy situation where he contributed all this effort he did all these nice things and then he just lost a lot of his property went into some really sad state started abusing drugs and alcohol uh, maybe it was suicidal and he ended up with nothing out of it and maybe that could have been that really hard worker but just because of some life events that were really harrowing he might be that homeless man in the streets who knows absolutely or he might have been having a like a drug that he can no longer afford because is it might might Scarelli decide to charge him 700 dollars, and his insurance company didn't want to pay it i mean because people believe even if you use a divorce case they say well he could have avoided the divorce but how could he have afforded you know how could he have avoided the rising of appeal by a thousand percent so he had a health you know he had a job and then he had this health care and he needed a pill that would treat his bipolar or lithium because it would treat bipolar and then they increased the value of that lithium and then his companies say well that's very difficult for us to pay and they lay him off because he had a temporary contract and that's why in europe the safety net of like national health care they might not know what it is, national health service but national health care in portugal in spain i know you have it in canada slightly different that avoids those issues you want to get homeless people off the street give them health care like seriously it's not that different uh, have compassion for for people put yourself in that position ask yourself at any turn like you said earlier like at any turn where i could have met that person had i not meet, met them and in them it, it caused you to assess those relationships it caused you to assess the difference between say talent and fate right and aurelius talks a lot about that like i don't know the nature of fate he says but it doesn't matter in, in the end it doesn't matter but the fact that it exists like how that if that fate is god or something else but the fact is it exists and yes we are called to be resilient in the face of that but also we are called to understand that other people for factors that are beyond their control cannot be as resilient right as a, a matter of chance or fortune that can just give us a benefit or a detriment in life it's something to definitely consider all right good now do you have any upcoming projects or papers following this one we just uh, put one in in review called uh, neanderthals rational which I would love to discuss with you about looking at what does it mean to be human? Because I think the need to blur the line between human and non-human is very important stoicism if we're going to have a proper debate about sustainability. So that would go in, the paper itself does not go into animal welfare, but it questions like, for example, if you go from the chimpanzee to the homo sapien, if no one had died out, where's the animal? You know, which one goes in the zoo? And with Neanderthals, we could interbreed with them. And we did interbreed uh, homo sapien women and male Neanderthals. So in our DNA, if you're European descent, you have 2 to 3% Neanderthal DNA. So they are very much a part of us. So we, you could have a conclusion that um, there's a child that's father is Neanderthal and mother is homo sapien, right? What do you do then? They have two sets of kinship, right? So that would make them human. That has that rational aspect. So that's one for the reasons I described about where do we draw the line now between human and non-human based on genetics and based on the other analysis of animal psychology. that That's where we're going with that. And that one is how do you educate a Stoic or how do you educate a pro Copton so they would be a sage? I think that's really important. So it, it will look at things like what kind of education. So it's a virtue based rather than like contextual. Like do we think about would uh, sages use solar panels? Well, maybe solar panels isn't what they would use, but they would certainly consider alternative forms of cleaner energy if they know that fuel is running out, for example. Also, what kind of environment would they have to be in? Because I don't necessarily think they would have to be institutional education, but certainly they'd have to feel safe and they'd have to feel healthy, right? So they'd have to be a have 
access to health care as children and as adults so that they can concentrate on progressing towards virtue. So that's the kind of the two like, very specific story papers, and it's uh, going to be interesting. And if anybody wants to contribute to that, and I mean actively contribute, you can criticize, but do it in a contributing way, <laughs> that would be great because I don't know all the answers, but I think stoicism is a robust enough theory to have them. So, for example, if you think that stoics should be, stoics should be vegan, that's all well and nice. If you start talking about animal rights, we don't have rights, so that doesn't make any sense. So please put it in a way that you could say we have obligations, say, to animals to we can, you know to consider how they feel, and especially if they're sentient. So I don't tend to think of it as a story. I don't think about veg- you know vegetables versus meat. I look at what animals are sentient, what animals are less so, and you know what abilities to tree have trees have to communicate because they actually communicate between each other so again now that i've done research into that the way that i view animals and plants has changed right and the way that i view policies towards them changes and that's why we are called as historics to understand the reality right. of, of of the world around us yeah, a lot of big questions a lot of things to consider and really speaks to the practical value of stoicism that it's not as some people criticize oh this like high-minded intellectual exercise in the ivory towers but rather how should we live day to day right how should we absolutely live our lives what's important what should we consider in making our decisions absolutely and if anybody knows for example they do computer science and they're interested in ai i'd love to have a discussion with you about what, what we should think about ai is that a rational being right so there's so many questions that we are looking at that would just be great if like uh you get to be in my like kai yellow pages that like, i call you up you're the computer science <laughs> and you can tell me about ai because i don't know enough i know some but i I do a little bit of programming in Python, but not enough to, to really have an opinion on it. So there, this is about taking the opportunity. And you might say, well, I'm not an academic. You don't have to be an academic. You just have to find a way, in my opinion, to contribute to this beautiful community and to the rest of the world around you. We're in this unique position where people are listening to what we have to say. So let's use our voice to say something worth saying. Let's you know have an opinion on Me Too. Let's have an opinion on AI and work and how work should look in the future. Let's think about climate change. Let's help people, you know, get their podcasts out. Like, you know, retweet, please. Like, more people need to know about this podcast and more people need to know about stoicism generally, like, just doing our bit, really. Yeah, thanks, and thanks for being a guest. I'll share your paper in the show notes and more information on how people can reach you. And you have an email address as well that you can share. Yeah, um, it's actually on the paper. So the paper that you'll share is open access. We actually paid for it to be open access because I felt that the... It was so important and the university agreed, so that was great. So yeah, you can go to that paper. There's also modernstoicism.com. There's an, if you just put, you know, like Kai, uh, Whiting and Stoicism, you'll find that as well. So if you're not like academically inclined or you just want the short version, you can go, go there. And yeah, I do my best to put the information in the public realm. And so please, please share it and have an informed opinion about it because having an opinion about it doesn't really help me, but an informed one does and it really helps me with the research and helps people like Justin ask interesting questions. Yes, and the paper title, Sustainable Development, Wellbeing and Material Consumption, A Stoic Perspective. Thank you. And yeah, please, please let me know what you think. And again, if you can, if you can contribute in any way. Uh, that'd be great. I mean, somebody was like reading it. They weren't an academic, but they read it and gave feedback. So before it was submitted. So that's really helpful. All right. Thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome. Thank you, Justin, for having me. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for more content. Visit my website at justinvacula.com where you can connect with me on social media and see past content on SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and other platform. Support my work through Patreon or PayPal. Share my content subscribe, and leave feedback to help support my efforts and keep this project going. I'd like to hear from you. Email me, justinvacula at gmail.com. Podcast music, used with permission, is brought to you by Phil Giordana's symphonic metal group, Fairyland. The song titled Master of the Waves is from their album, Score to a New Beginning. Find more information in the show notes. Have a great day. Raise yourself.